Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to join the community debate then go to nathanoakley.com and check out the Flat Earth Debate forum which you should definitely all join. If you'd like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere. There's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreon, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out to Adrian Quintana, Alistair Main, Billy Hyvolt, Burn Fat Till My Stomach Is As Flat As The Earth, Chow Young Cat, Dank, Dave Rakia Gifford, David Wayne Foster, Edwin Johnson, Felix Hung, Fireball X, God Rockin', Jeronism, Joshua, Kirsten, Life is Short, Matt, Michael, Nyby, Paige, Katar Craig, Reinhardt, Rene, Sally, Sam, Skeptic936, Texas Mike, FlatEarthChannel.com, Tina, Tom, and that's about it. Thank you very much indeed to all of you who do support me on Patreon. Uh, we did have Paul in the Hangouts, although with a few technical mic issues. Hopefully he's resolved those now. Can you hear me, Paul? I can. I switched from my laptop to my Chromebook, so is that better? Coming through better? Much better. Very clear. Good to have okay. you. Good to have you too. Or good oh. to be here. Sorry. I'm, About 20, I'm, minutes, I'm, 20 minutes before we go live, just so you know. I got you. I got you. I was thinking um, while you were doing the intro... One of the biggest things I've noticed so far, even in this discussion, is how they, the definitions, we never can agree on terms. <laughs> you know what I mean? They need to equivocate terms, so they need to justify the use of a presupposition by saying that in a scientific hypothesis, they have an assumption. They leave out that the assumption is mirrored by the null, which would state that that which you assume causes the effect does not cause the effect and also a hypothesis is meaningless if it hasn't gone forth and been put through rigorous experimentation so it's kind of a pointless equivocation that they use that's why you can't settle on terms with these fundies because they need to equivocate because they're making up their their world to meet their religious standards it's never going to work yeah i came in part way yesterday to the show because i was out and about yesterday and um I kept, you know, I didn't hear the part until I re-listened to the show where you, you know, they really technically, when it comes to movement of the earth, uh, they have no observed phenomena. They can say, well, well, the stars are moving, but me moving, there's no phenomena there. If I'm standing still, there's no phenomena. Is that me standing still? So, then that you're right, they have to initially, to right off the bat, it'd be a, you know, well, if the Earth is, I think that's funny when you say if the Earth is, that's assuming you're a consequence, no matter what you say. Right. <laughs> well, at the very least, begging the question, but, well, they do claim there's an effect. They, the way they, we had this discussion with Anthony only the other day, and he's like, well, why let them beg the question of Earth turning? You know, we shouldn't be talking about Coriolis unless they first establish the Earth turns, which is quite correct. But I, I then pointed out that that's how they segue into begging the question so they'll say because Coriolis is there and then they'll give you some loose example with like Neil deGrasse Tyson a ball or a bullet a sniper bullet's their favorite because that is the segue into giving you an argument about Coriolis effect an effect that could take place on a roundabout but by doing so they will automatically force you in a position where you beg the question all arguments that take place about Coriolis deviation will be translatable into their non-inertial spinning reference frame of a presupposed spinning ball Earth. That's how the magic trick works. And it just took a while. It just, you know, it's only, don't get me wrong, I've only actually figured out the, the real methodology of what they're doing and why they're doing it in the last week or two. But now it seems obvious. They, they always need to beg the question. That's always, shout out to Validation Boy. He was the first one to really put this succinctly on a video. Um, every single globe earth proof starts with the presupposition that you're on a spinning ball earth this is no exception so you start with the premise 
And how do you get into the premise? Well, with an observed phenomena, and that's what you're querying. Well, they say Coriolis is the phenomena we observe. We observe deviation. And then you start arguing about Coriolis, not about the premise they're trying to prove. That premise is automatically assumed when you argue about Coriolis. Because what's Coriolis? Well, it's in regards to spinning reference frames. So if you've got a spinning reference frame and you're arguing about it, then you're automatically begging the question that Earth's that spinning reference frame. So it's a win-win in their perception. Well, that's not going to happen no more. No, no, you're begging the question. Prove Earth spins before you start with it as your premise. Yeah, I was sort of thinking about that when, when I first started getting into the inertial and non-inertial reference frames. I'm going like, well, the inertial reference frame would be either you're standing still or, or moving at a constant velocity. If you're in the non-inertial reference frame, that means you're accelerating or you're curving. So they've got to prove the first one first, you know, and then build into the second one. Exactly, that's so. Anthony's point. Prove Earth spins first, then we'll argue about Coriolis. If they say, well, Coriolis deviation is a demonstration of Earth spins, how have you validated that effect that you claim is an effect? That effect as Earth turn being the cause. How have you validated that? You Have you varied and manipulated Earth turn? No. Hey, Chocolate. Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Can You're you particularly me? quiet today. Yeah, let me change my uh, headset. Yeah, I'm good. Hey, Very good. No quibbles. Did you all subscribe to Martin Leaker? Finally got his channel sorted out, as in, not his original channel, but a channel I can actually promote and send people to without fear that it's going to be eradicated a day later. I haven't, but I will. I'll find him. What's, what's his ch new channel name again? Just called Butter Martin. British. It's just called Martin Leaker. So he, he he thought he'd got a backup channel. It, it wasn't a backup channel. He was attached to his original channel. So he very quickly lost control of that as well, unfortunately, which is, you know, it, he just didn't know. I mean, obviously, ignorance is no excuse in these circumstances. He's only got himself to blame. But that doesn't mean I'm not sympathetic. And now he's in a position where he's got a, a completely new account, new email address, started up a new channel. He's got to go through all the rigmarole of 15 minute uploads and having no real be benefits offered to him. But he's already over a thousand subscribers. Um, you know, rapidly went up a couple of hundred after me doing two adverts or one on this channel, Nathan Oakley, and one on the main channel, Nathan Oakley 1980. So he's at least at the point where if he can get up to 4,000 hours rapidly, he can, he can at least monetize his channel and be back earning a living from YouTube, which he was earning a decent living. It's, you know, heartbreaking to think that he built up a channel over four years and then it just gets taken away from him, he's left with no living. But there we go, that's life, and he can still build it back up if he puts the work in, which I'm sure he will. That's also why it's wise to not have all your eggs in one basket either. That way, if something was to happen, you could have a backup. <laughs> sure. I mean, well, initially it seemed like he hadn't because he got, you know, he'd started recommending people go to a backup channel. Um, and at the time I was like, well, I want to see what the, I actually thought hopefully he'll get his main one back. So I'll just promote that if it's lost a load of subs or, you know, I don't know what's going to happen was kind of my thoughts. So when his second channel was like premiering something and it didn't seem like it was, it just seemed odd. I got in touch with him yesterday. I'm like, have you actually premiered this? And he's like, no, I'm not in control of it. I'm not even capable of modding the chat. I'm like, okay, well, I'll just check if I'm a mod, which I did. And I was. So I started to tell people, look, Martin doesn't have control of this channel. He's here chatting and he's not even got a spanner. Um, but this is not Martin's channel anymore. And the, initially the chatters were like, ha ha ha, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, I'm not joking. This channel's attached to his original channel. Um, and then they're sort of, obviously, they're then really confused. With, well, do I unsubscribe from this channel? And it's like, well, you can if you want to. The bottom line is he hasn't got control of it. He might get control of it again. It is originally his channel, but it's been stolen from him. Swindled, basically. So he's been swindled out of both his backup channel and his original channel because they weren't separate channels, as much as they may seem like that to an, you know, an, the untrained eye. So now he has got an actual new channel, and it started off from nothing. It's now got a 1,000-plus subs, just over maybe creeping up to 1,100 subs, 
Um, and that's been within two days of opening that account. Now, because he's obviously got complete control over it, there's, I don't think, any danger that that's suddenly just going to, again, me say, oh, here's another Martin Leak channel. I don't think that's going to be the case um, now that the dust has settled. And if he does regain his channel, then wonderful. But it doesn't look promising. And he's got to do something in the meantime. And he can. He can set up a new channel. He has. And he, he's perfectly capable of continuing to live stream and put out premieres as he has been doing consistently. So I don't think it'll take him a great deal of time to, to rebuild up that currently small channel um, to, to at least some some substantial degree. Um, it won't be as big as his original channel, not not initially, not without a fair degree of time passing and a lot of work on Martin's part, but hopefully he'll get there eventually. I can only offer him the support I can offer him. Well, I'm subscribed now. I just subscribed. Cool. Ten minutes, and we'll go live. Radio check, radio check. Much better, Chocolate, much better. What do you think the next uh, question will be that gets argued about? So, what's it been recently? We've got gas pressure, gravity, and then Coriolis. What do you reckon next? Sun? Distance to the sun, maybe? Uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> this point it's a crapshoot whatever they decide is they're winning well can't say winning but <laughs> i mean I, I, I don't know yesterday's anik was on 24 7 again and like i basically like just told them bro just retire this argument get you nowhere all you're doing is begging the question in the first place so we're not even talking about this nonsense anymore So he did essentially exactly as QE predicted then? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shocker. Pretty much. He, he's still on putting everybody in the non inertial reference frame. And that's it. <laughs> as long as everybody focuses on that. You know, even, even though he'll literally say, oh, but, oh, what did he say yesterday? If you, you, you have the pendulum swinging, or, or no, you have the pendulum set up, and as to apply no force to it, you attach a string to it or something, and you burn it, and you let it go, right? So at least you're not putting any further force on it. It moves in a straight line. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? Moves in a straight line. Where is that moving through the straight line, in a straight line? Oh, through the inertial reference frame. Oh, I thought we didn't have an inertial reference frame, Zanuck. <laughs> and again, he does it to himself again. And of course, the the entire time you're in that discussion, he's begging the question that the descriptions you're giving in regards to an effect that could take place on a roundabout, it's always from the standpoint that that roundabout's being compared to a presupposed spinning ball earth, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's how they do it. Get you to argue about Coriolis, when in reality all they're doing is begging the question. Yeah, and I was thinking about it last night. Like, yeah, the, the whole time we've been talking about this, we kind of have been begging or allowing them to beg the question. But in a lot of ways, I feel like it's good what we did because we've gone through this like so much and destroyed it from every angle that now it's, I think it's cool to just retire it. <laughs> well, yeah, you could always do that uh, early on. I've said this many times. You, you can just cut the legs off any argument, and Anthony and I, you're typically, the roles have been reversed with Coriolis. It's weird. So Anthony's telling me, why are you letting them beg the question? Now, it's normally me going, look, why are we even entertaining this argument? You're presupposing this force or you're presupposing this R value or you're presupposing the sky is a vacuum or whatever their presupposition is in that regard. But Anthony's the one saying, just prove Earth spins first. Now, yes, my rebuttal is quite valid, which is to say, well, they'll just assert Coriolis as their starting point to argue about Coriolis rather than just proving Earth spins. They'll assume it in every single Coriolis demonstration. But by doing so, i.e. allowing them to beg the question and you 
get to the point where you understand how their arguments are formulated. So if they force the issue, which they can do sometimes, I'm sure some of them will, Zanik was the one in this instance, to force the issue, then you're into figuring out how they're obfuscating these different reference frames, using them to equivocate between a ball earth that isn't actually spinning and an effect that doesn't take place into an effect they claim takes place to make the argument begin so that they can beg the question. And you can only really see that unfold if you go through the arguments and understand how it's actually not even a related argument to Earth. Coriolis effect has nothing to do with Earth because we don't see Coriolis deviation. So that that's where the argument really begins and ends. It doesn't stop them from saying, yeah, we do see deviation in the sniper's bullet. Therefore, I'm going to argue about how Earth and atmosphere travel is one. There's only one reference frame and that's, you know, you're automatically into earth traveling as what in other words earth is always going to be the spinning reference frame in whatever example it doesn't matter if they're arguing against coriolis deviation in the case of airplanes and drones or arguing for it in the case of footballs and bullets it makes no odds so long as they've got you to beg the question so long as they're talking about this this effect taking place on a spinning ball earth that's the only real objective hey on the gas pressure thing there's another way to argue this question because they're, they're they're shifting their argument to a little bit at least i've heard them on the discord um like entropy how they're saying basically the weight of the particle the mass of the particle is stopping the stopping it from escaping well what they're arguing then is how does that how does mass or weight stop entropy that's what they're saying so how does that occur you know when that's i mean so that that starts to fall apart right off the bat because gravity or weight has nothing to do with overcoming entropy it can't right correct, correct. absolutely spot on that's why again <laughs> another role reversal anthony telling both q qe and i off for be for allowing them to beg the question so we would say have them both have gravity in 200 percent effect from einstein and uh not uh, newtonian cavendish reverend john mitchell you can have both right now, Anthony's like, well, why are you allowing them this? Why are you be allowing them to beg the question? And it's because of the point you've just made. Gravity, force or otherwise, does not overcome entropy. It's just as simple as that. Sorry, I stepped away from the mic. But yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about that a while back. Because every illustration you ever see, they, well, they either illustrate it as like gas is expanding into a vacuum or it's the loss of information kind of thing or the reduction of information i think that's the other definition i've heard so how does mass or weight overcome that those two things it doesn't you know you've got to i know so i'm saying how do you do that I, it just doesn't make sense once you start looking at it even at their level the physics the physics level it doesn't make sense yeah they won't find a citation either they'll find kids graphic illustrations taught to high school kids which is essentially teaching them the contradiction itself that's what they'll present here but no, entropy isn't going to be overcome by gravity. Entropy is demonstrable in all forms at the closest to the ground, even if you have the presupposition of a force that's not a force, but you can think of it as a force. So it's meaningless to assert this because it's easily debunked by demonstration. Mic check. Hello. You. Good morning. Hey, Ted, man. Can you guys hear me? Um, we hear you. Oh, hey. Hey, what do you think about, like, what do you guys know about, um, oh, shoot, what's the word I'm looking for now? I can't remember it. Was uh, that God's couple? Yeah, hey, how's it going, man? I'm, what's up, man? Uh, hydrosta Not much. Um, hydrostatic pressure, like, I don't know, it seems like when we have this debate about atmospheric pressure, if you will, I hate to use that word, but you know what I mean. Um, you know, we're thinking about it as pushing, you know, pressure pushing against a balloon or a tire, but I've been talking lately about maybe it's more like hydrostatic pressure. So the weight, like hydrostatic pressure is just the weight of a column of fluid at rest. And it could be used for air, too. So it could be just the weight of a column of air at rest. And that kind of explains the gradient. That would explain perfectly, actually, the gradient. Oh, what a day! 
What a lovely day! Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already, how dare you, then be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to join the community debate then go to nathanoakley.com and check out the Flat Earth Debate Forum which you should definitely all join. If you'd like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live. There's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show. And one last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. Now we are joined by 10th man, Chocolate Sane, Paul, and I think that's it in G+. How are you all doing? Doing great. Good, have you all good. good morning. We've also got a fair few people in Discord, so welcome one and all. Hi Nathan, it's really good to be Yeah, it's really good to have you all. Such an enthusiastic Discord server. Any signs of Earth curvature? Well, not from Mexico. Nope. Wait, that's not you in Mexico? <laughs> no, I, I just decided every time I say not from California, I might as well just say everywhere I've ever been because I've never seen it. <laughs> I see. What about axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? Any signs of that? Nope. No, no spin zone. No evidence of Earth-based Coriolis. No evidence. No deviation of any kind. Any evidence that you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? Impossible. Any, anyone watching that's not a regular viewer, that means space is fake. Sky is not a vacuum. Any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the center of a presupposed spherical Earth? More cartoon characterizations of something they can't prove. Well, the priest. They do got some cool cartoons, though. I mean, other than that, no. Lovely, lovely cartoons. Page 37 of your high school textbook, right? That's because chocolate, your icon is a cartoon. You're biased. Yep, yep. <laughs> so but that, that would mean I should believe in it, right? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> but I don't. So apparently I can differentiate between cartoons and reality. Thanks. Any evidence of the R value, the presupposition of a spherical radius? No evidence of the R value, but they have it in everything, and they talk from that position at the starting gate. But sticks and shadows, sticks and shadows, Nathan. Come on, sticks and shadows. That's they prove R, R value. That, that's still presupposed R. It's pr still presupposing Earth's a sphere. I love those kind of silences. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? No, just the light in the sky, and no one has measured it. Any nope. scientific evidence of gravity? The non-force force, non-force force, non force, force? A non-force. Force that you can think of as a force, but is not actually a force that gives rise to a force that's not a force called gravity. 
long as you don't force me to answer this question, I'll be okay. Boom, boom. So, that concludes the <laughs> housekeeping. They you know, watching. growing up, all they had was gravity. That's all they talked about. It's, it's this, it's this. Now, I'm no longer a child. and All this time, oh, well, it's never really there. Hello. Hey, Arwen. I did a couple of adverts for those of you, I've said this already on the pre-show, but for those of you watching on Nathan Oakley 1980, I just did a couple of adverts for Martin Leakey, or Leakey, mm -hmm. Otherwise known as Flat Earth British, so check out those adverts. There's links to his singular new channel, so his least subscribed channel, on account of the fact that it's brand new, about three days old. Essentially, Martin had a 30,000 subscriber channel and a backup channel that unfortunately was linked to it by way of email. Subsequently, there wasn't any way to keep re retain control of that second backup channel, so he's had to start completely from fresh. So, as I say, there are a couple of adverts that have stuck out on both this Nathan Oakley 1980 and the backup channel for me, Nathan Oakley, um, that are just directing people to go and subscribe to that particular channel. So, yeah, Be Here or Be Sphere on Martin Leake's channel, which is Flat Earth British, the show that he runs. Good stuff. Spread the word. Yeah, I went on and subscribed yesterday. Put out the link in chat. There you go, Arwen. Put out the link in chat. I'm I could do, couldn't I? Yeah, that's a good, good idea. Good morning, all. Hey, hey, hey. Thanks, Chocolate. Yo, it's good, Righteous. Chilling, then, chilling. Excited for today's show. Maybe a calm one. You know, there's been a, a line drawn under Coriolis effect in the last couple of days. Yeah, I was in the Discord uh, one late night, early morning, up until like four o'clock, going back and forth with a couple of the guys. Lots of soul searching and contemplation, dealing with loss, that sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's a mental block there, like a mental disconnect as to why they disagree with us. It doesn't have to do with the data. At least that's my take on it, because when I explain to them why there's a difference between the physical application of what Coriolis is versus them trying to get me to intellectualize what they mean, I pointed that out. But if I can point that out, that means it's a real concern, but they don't like it. So. I no, they definitely don't like it. I wonder if, uh, well, since it's slow, I actually had a good idea. You may have to repeat that. You cut off at the end. Yeah, he's in and out. Yeah, as as fluid as ever. I've just stuck Martin's. Uh... Yeah, no, sorry about that. Uh, okay. So, are you guys like? Do you do you stream the the show on Facebook at all? I don't stream on Facebook. I only use Facebook to send links to the YouTube video daily. Depending on what mood I'm in, I might send one out for the after show today. I've sent this one out, so this has had links go out to Facebook, Twitter, Skype. In the uh, in the future, if possible, uh, is there any way to to get the show on Facebook Live? Because I have a lot of conversation on Facebook, and I would like to do it in real time, like set up a live party or something like that to watch as I'm explaining why <laughs> everybody else's arguments are wrong. Not just to shout it out and say you're wrong, but to basically point out the fact of why they're wrong. And I think uh, just expanding it to Facebook in a, on a live basis would be awesome. If you had time to do it, if it, if it, if it wasn't that complicated.
I've done it before. I mean, I've done it like you can live stream from YouTube. You can just start a live stream on your mobile phone via Facebook, and I've done that a couple of times, but for more, mostly for videos of my family and to try and figure out how to use it. But as for using a stream key and simulcasting via Facebook, it's certainly something I can look into. Thanks for giving me the nod. It's something I hadn't thought about in a long while. It's a very good idea because I'm in groups with large amounts of people. And uh, I usually get them to think. I usually get them to go, hmm, okay, hasn't been presented like this from other flat earthers I look into it. And usually I'll say, yeah, watch the show. And then they go to the show and bro, I'm not watching an hour and a half. So if I'm doing it real time, you know, it just makes a difference. And I'm sure the show could grow that way. Any, any way the show could grow helps. So, you know, I'm just saying. Sure. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, Sleeping Warrior. What's up, Riley? Have I missed housekeeping? Is it gone? Yeah, unfortunately. It's gone, Riley. Can I have a massive whinge? Yeah, go ahead. Mike's all yours. <laughs> Let me get it on screen. Uh, I should have really had this ready. Uh, I had it open a minute ago. Where is it? You know, do you remember the other day when we had... Um, was it uh, Jolien Bloomfield's citation on screen and the rumpus read from it and there was two sentences. There was the first sentence that supported the rumpus and then he completely didn't mention at all the second sentence that totally destroyed his argument because basically it destroyed his argument and he didn't want us to know about it. Well, obviously that was on, on the back of a hangout that I had where I gave rumpus pre-disclosure of my arguments and rumpus didn't give me the pre-disclosure back. I accept that he didn't give me the pre-disclosure back because he didn't realize it was required or asked of. And I'll put it down to a simple misunderstanding. But the same things happened with Jem Panda and this guy, Ar Artexis, Ar whatever his name is. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the guy's name. Um, where they've read one part of a sentence, but then completely ignored the second part, which totally contradicts their position. And they've misled loads of people that are paying attention at the minute to the topic in question. And I, I just want to I want to show this because this is um, well, this is like Rumpus times a thousand. We all know what Rumpus did was wrong. He knows it was wrong. You, you can't just ignore the second part um, because it doesn't suit your position. But what Gem Panda and this other guy have done is so much worse, and. It, I'm I'm just lost for words that this is this can even be, you know, th this is even acceptable by the ball earthers, and really I, I want people on the ball earth side to question this, the 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 honesty of what Gem Panda is trying to argue, because it's not okay to pick and choose the bits that support your assertion if there's a, an immediately following sentence that does not. So I'm just getting to the relevant uh, thing. Here we go. So if I screen share now, let me just get rid of this here. So if I put that there, and then I put this here. Okay, so screen share, screen share. And everyone's gonna have a view on this, and it's totally, and it's totally, totally fine, because we don't really know the, the answer to the, 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 the posed question. Um, so most most people will be familiar that I've asked the question uh, to the to the to the judiciary, if you will, um, whether or not the teaching of the Copernican model is lawful in the sense that it's a bit of a one sided topic and there are opposing views that don't get mentioned, and if they do get mentioned, they get ridiculed with scorn. Um, and one of the points that's come up in the conversation is that the the question that I'm asking is not by definition political. Now in the, the lead case, which I've got on screen now, Dimmock against Secretary of State, because it was uh, to do with a, an overtly political video, the judge did not define what is political in the context of an overtly political video because it was overtly political. So he didn't define what it is, but what he did say is what it's not. And what the judge said in, in the Dimmock case at paragraph four earlier on is, the defense for the, the the defense counsel for the secretary of state 
with equal skill, has adopted a very realistic position on the part of the defendants, does not challenge that the film promotes political views. There is thus no need to consider any analysis or definition of the word political. And then it says in brackets, which is plainly not limited to party political, such as that in the McGovern case, right? So if you can remember at this point that it's not limited to party political, but the ball earth morons have come back to me and said, eh, Riley, but your case isn't political by nature. And that may well be true. That may ultimately be the decision of the judge or the court in question when deciding whether or not this is lawful to teach the children the way it teaches. And they cite these two paragraphs, but they stop at this point here. So in the first paragraph, it reads, scientific hypothesis, such as, such as the hypothesis that climate change is mainly attributable to man-made emissions of greenhouse gases, do not themselves constitute political views within the meaning of 407, even if they are doubted by particular political groups. But in any event, nothing in the 96 Act obliges teachers to adopt a position of studied neutrality between, on the one hand, scientific views which reflect the great majority of world scientific opinion, and, on the other, a minority view held by a few dissident scientists. We could paraphrase that into heliocentrism really pretty easily. I'm not going to do it, but we can all imagine how that would, tra that, that would translate. But then, this is the bit where it goes a little bit dishonest a lot dishonest because they read from this and they claim this is a massive humdinger of a victory for them. And I completely and utterly think this is dishonest. They say it continues at 19. Of course that is right. And 406 and 407 are not concerned with scientific disputes or with the approach of teachers to them. I agree with that. That's not the contentious issue. That's the bit that they're saying is it is what Riley loses his case on. But I agree with this. This is not about whether or not there is a scientific dispute and how teachers teach it. It's not about whether or not the Earth's flat or not. It's not about whether the Earth's a ball or not. That bit is absolutely correct and is not my point. They stop here and they do not proceed with the following sentence. And I'm going to, I'm going to point out to everybody that's watching this right now that this is fundamentally dishonest because the sentence continues and it starts with the word however. It says, however, as will be seen, some of the errors or departures from the mainstream by Al Gore in the course of his dynamic exposition do arise in the context of alarmism and exaggeration in support of his political thesis. That is, is a really key point because you can paraphrase that into a documentary by Flat Earthers, for example, in the course of our dynamic exposition do arise in the context of I don't know, fraudulent application of the scientific method and um, pseudoscience being presented as, as real science in support of our political arguments that perhaps this might not be lawful. So it, it translates perfectly, right? But this is the key bit. It is in that context that the defendant, the Secretary of State, in actively distributing the films to all schools may need to make it clear that some or all of the matters promoted by some or all of those matters are not supported or promoted by the defendant. And then there is a view to the contrary, i.e. at least the mainstream view. So if we were to create um, a political document, a, polit a political kind of um, uh, brochure or video in, similar to Al, Al Gore's video, and we were then to be able to present it somehow, I don't, know how, I don't know how Al Gore did this, but if we were to present a politically charged and politically motivated counter argument to the teachings of the, the heliocentric argument to say that, well, how do you have gas pressure next to a black, and all the housekeeping points. Then I'll go, uh, the Secretary of State would have to put these um, disclaimers on, these two disclaimers, uh, one saying that these views are not supported, but whatever, but, and, and the, the, there is a view to the contrary, the mainstream. But isn't that also true the other way around too, if there are opposing views that are treated under Section 406 are promoted as partisan political? Because... It is true that um, there is only a one-sided presentation of views, one-sided meaning partisan. It is promoted. There are no other views that are dissenting views demonstrated or, or made aware to children that people don't all accept this. And then the political element to it is, well, at the end of the day, the national curriculum is policy by the government. That policy being implemented is political. Now, how you interpret um, political is important because the judge didn't define what political is. He defined what it's not. And we know that it's not limited to party political. But I would say, well, 
it makes sense that if there's a policy called the national curriculum, the policy of change that allows things to be put in and removed from the national curriculum, that policy, that government policy, it makes sense that that policy would be political because it is the views of the government at the time in relation to what the kids are being taught. Nobody could tell me that that's not right because it isn't defined by any judge. You might disagree. That might be true. That might be well. That might well, might well be all well and good. There may be another interpretation that the judge might adopt himself to what is political. He may go with something completely else, some, something completely different. But to completely dismiss the following sentences that follow this is not really acceptable because all we've got to do to make this political is to present some opposing views, which we can do, and make them political in our approach. And then all of a sudden, it is it is then political by definition. We've created it as political the way that Al Gore did. That makes the topic political the way Al Gore did. Do we need to do that? It looks like we have to, but it's kind of already political anyway, because there are enough people in Flat Earth as a topic questioning whether or not, A, it's a ball, and B, right now we're looking at, is it being taught lawfully? And it may be that it's not being taught lawfully, or it may be that it is. But at least it's a legitimate question about progressing the point to see whether or not we can prove that it is actually a sphere. Because if they can't prove that there's a gravity or that there's an axial rotation or all the things that are in there, it really shouldn't be being taught because that is pseudoscience. And everybody just accepts it because it's the official narrative. Well, what if it's not dem if it's if it's not complying with the scientific method and it's therefore pseudoscience and it's being pushed on children and there's no alternative views presented to alert children that there's a legitimate conversation there and there's therefore no subsequent debate that follows. I got to 38, 37, 38, and I didn't realize that this was a contentious topic. But if I had found out at the age of 13, 14, 15, that not everybody shared the same views and there were legitimate opposing views to the contrary, and these are the reasons why, and they were presented in a balanced presenting way to show that you can't have gas pressure next to a vacuum without some kind of container, then that would have brought the conversation that I'm having right now as an adult back to the age when I was about 15, 16, 17, and I'd have been asking for the science that proves it. That is a much more healthy position to be in as a child, where you can have proper debate in the classroom with intelligent people, not morons on the internet with trolls and, and zero. Because if you come to this topic as an adult, you end up with the likes of Mark Taylor and co. That's not legitimate um, like opposition. What you want is you want Mr. Johnson telling you that gas pressure can exist next to a vacuum. And you want to then say, but sir, how do you prove that? And then Mr. Johnson's not able to prove it. And then he has to say, well, not everybody agrees with this. But the point is that you have that back and forth, the debate, the discussion, at the time when you're in school, when you've got intelli intelligent people with you, libraries and stuff like that, you've got resources. Not when you leave it into adulthood and you and you end up with moron trolls that ring up like Bob Nodell at, um, off guard on whilst he's live broadcasting stuff and get him to commit atrocities in his verbal vocabulary or whatever that's completely ridiculous how can we have a legitimate conversation when you have the actions of trolls that dox people or that ring them up at three in the morning when, when they know that the mum's dying all that kind of nonsense why can't we have a normal conversation and ultimately the the act the 96 act requires on at section 406 it requires them that there to be a non-promotion it needs to be not promoted any partisan political views well, it does seem to be political. We do need a judge to decide what is political in this context, but it's definitely partisan and it is definitely promoted. And I don't agree with it. I think that's unlawful. And I don't think there's any, any more on ball or out there that can prove me wrong. Because I think that when you implement policy of a state, that's kind of by definition political. You might not agree with me. I might be wrong. The judge may disagree with me. I might be wrong. But what does political mean when it's not limited to party politics? Yeah, I don't know. I and I'm asking that question, but neither does anybody else in this topic. But at least we can all say that we are being brainwashed because you can't have gas pressure next to a, a vacuum without some kind of membrane. Everybody realizes that that's a contradiction and they just don't like this conversation. That's why they've got to put it in the bin. Well, you guys just don't understand what's going on here. It's being asked and it may end up in course at some point. Right at the moment, it might not do. And it is purely academic. It may never go anywhere, but at least it'll stimulate conversation. So let's not have a conversation about ridicule and scorn. Let's have a conversation about whether it's lawful or not that you get taught a one-sided education that allows you to believe that you can have gas pressure without a membrane of some kind next to a, a vacuum. It's ridiculous. I'm done.
Right, you're being heckled from the audience by Trish Blythe. First super chat. There's three. <laughs> Do you hear that sigh? <laughs> I will I'll debate you. You, you just... Oh, sorry, I'll start again. I will debate you just to make this stop. That was the first super chat. Second super chat. We, can let, we can't let the audience be the judge. Come on, I told you to stop. That was her second super chat. And her third, so from Trish Blythe again. Thank you very much for all the super chats, Trish. I will prove you wrong. It's not promotion. It's on the curriculum. It's teaching. It is promotion. It's, by definition, promotion requires proper tuition and debate as defined by the Dimmick case. And there is no proper tuition. There's only like one-sided um, tuition that allows them to believe gas pressure next to a vacuum is okay. That's not proper tuition. There's definitely no debate. That's the requirements for promotion from the Dimmick case. So there's definitely no prom uh, promotion. If you think you can prove that wrong, be my guest. Dimmick doesn't agree with you. What else you got? Thank you again for the super chats, Trish Blythe. You know, uh, I'd agree with you, Riley, because I remember being in high school and having them roll one of those uh, televisions in and having to sit and watch a whole um, special or program or documentary or whatever with Al Gore telling everybody that we're all going to be underwater in about 10 years. Now, this was about, I don't know, 20 years ago. <laughs> so we're not underwater, apparently. So, uh, you know, but I had to sit there in the classroom and watch it, and, you know, almost accept it. This is what's going to happen, kids, if we don't start doing something. But, you know. There's still... They're still doing a chocolate. This uh, little girl yesterday who hit the news, uh, she was an actress. She was paid to cry on television about robbing her childhood away. I mean, it's, uh, the left is, goes to no limits. You know, they, they'll pull out child actors and then some family will be watching it at you know dinner time and their child will say, yeah, they taught that in school too. And it's hey, such Nathan. a joke. Nathan, I want you to address the rumpus for me. He says, gas pressure can exist perfectly happily without a container. If something like gravity exerts a force on the gas particles, easy and, easy and observed to be correct. And gravity does exert such a force. Nathan, do you want to kill that one? Gravity is, is not true a force. Walking outside? Gravity is not a force. George Everybody Wilson. knows gravity is not a force, rumpus. How do you ex What's slowing the gas particles, the velocity of the gas particles down, rumpus? They're under pressure. So where's that pressure going? It's all going in all directions. And by definition, it's got to impact the walls of the container to have pressure, right? We definitely do have pressure. But if there's no container, then something, a force, according to Newton's second law of motion, um, and no, first law of motion, an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by a force. But you haven't got a force rumpus, have you? Because you haven't got gravity as a force. So whatever gravity is or isn't, it's definitely not a force. But you do need something to slow that 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 velocity of particles down. What is that force, please, Rumpus? And we know it's not gravity, so don't say gravity. Uh, let me ask Rumpus a question, if you can hear me. Rumpus, show me how mass or weight can overcome entropy. Demonstrate that, please. And the other thing that Rumpus says that is hilarious, he says that scales are a force measuring device. He also says that mass is not a force. Well, if mass is not a force, given the definite, given the calculation for weight is mass times little g, if mass is not a force and little g is not a force because everywhere says that gravity is not a force, what force is exerting itself on the scales then, Rumpus? Because you haven't got mass as a force and you haven't got gravity as a force, but something's putting something on there, isn't it? There is an interaction. And I know he did say that weight isn't a force, right? Mass, weight, none of that's a force. No, no, he says weight, mass is a force. No, he says mass is not a force, weight is a force. And he says weight is a force because weight is mass times little g. So mass is not a force, but neither is little g. But something's pushing down on the scale, isn't it, Rumpus? And you can't have gravity because no so weight, Weight's not a force, but mass times, mass times his little acceleration is a force. That's what he said. <laughs> But little g is an acceleration due to the, gra the, um, the gravitational pull of the Earth. Well, if gravity is not pulling, then that's not a force either. But there is something right. pushing down on the uh, scales, isn't the rumpus? So what is it? I, I still want to know what the force is that you added to that uh, glass of water that made that egg move. 
So I saw acceleration. Uh, <laughs> what about I didn't, made it, I didn't see you had force. For <laughs> what about the force that made it stop, um, uh, Chocolate? Because don't forget, for an object in motion to remain in, uh, to, an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by a force. There must have been two forces. There must have been a force to make it move initially, and then another force to make it stop. Gravity seems to be very confusing. It's a fictitious force, Anthony. Do you know what a fictitious force is? Yeah, one that doesn't exist. No. A fictitious force, also called a pseudo force or inertial force, is a force that appears to act on a mass whose motion is described using non inertial frames of reference. Oh, apparent force, so it's and not real. Appears. It just mm. looks like it's that. You go, go first, Darwin. Sorry, uh, Chocolate. Say that again, Darwin, please. So it just appears to be like something it isn't actually it just looks like it yeah, sort you of could mistakenly Coriolis, interpret which it which is not actually force it's it's an apparent deviation based on reference for you should be very mindful when, when words like appears uh ends up in definitions because that's what gets you <laughs> right because something appearing to do something means it's probably not actually doing it. It's right. just appearing to do it. Right? Yeah. right. And by the way, the deviation is real. There is actually deviation going on. It's just oh, yeah. you could mistake that deviation to be caused by an apparent force, which turns out not to be the case as part of the effect. Oh, there, there, is, there is no deviation. No, there is. <laughs> Not, not, not oh, of the version-based variety. Nope. Let's let's clear that. Right, up. right. Uh, let me do let that me on America I mean. round all day. What we're asking for here is let's prove the Earth is actually rotating, and then let's see if we can get that deviation in reality. Thanks. Uh, let me explain what I mean by there's no deviation. Um, if you're on a merry-go-round and you toss a ball to the person that's directly opposite to you. The ball appears to deviate, but it's not. It's going in a straight line. It only appears to deviate because you're rotating, but it's not deviating at all. That's why it's described as an apparent deviation. You got it. Yeah, but if it's it says apparent, apparent deviation, because it's it implies not that it is deviating. Hold, hold on, Chuck, uh, Anthony. Say again, Babs. It's described as apparent because it's not actually deviating. Yeah. Well, 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 because well, you are the one deviating in reality. Yeah, you're the With one that's reality. moving in relationship to it. I'd also like to go back. You said it was a pseudo force, and then you said right on the on the uh, back of it, an inertial force. Is pseudo and inertial synonymous? Number one. Number two. Why are you entertaining questions from morons in the gallery? I mean, you're you're entertaining questions <laughs> no, this from somebody is... that says, "Mr. Air is not the atmosphere." That's number two. Thanks. Uh, this is a, a de definition that I read off of Google. This is not what someone else told me. Yeah, but I'm, hey. uh, the question still stands. You said uh, pseudo force and an inertial force, so. Does that mean pseudo and inertial are synonymous? Uh, according to this explanation on uh, Google, yep, they are synonymous. Yeah. yeah, well, then you can shit can that, can't you? Wow, why Google, are they not is synonymous? It Google, Google's, was it Google a source or a medium? It's a medium. Let me get the exact yeah. source. Hang on. All right. Um, it's Wikipedia. Yeah, Wikipedia or any any Elmer Fudd and their sister can state anything or change anything, right? Is it cited? No, it's not. Someone probably changed it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. If it's not cited, uh, you, you could do, go down to the tavern and ask, you know, Joe what he thought, what he thinks about it. It has the same veracity. Thanks. Can you clarify, was that a technical term? Um, the fictitious force? 
No, shit can. It is a, a technical term. Yeah, that is. <laughs> it's file 13, uh, file 13, shit can, same thing. A quick shout out to SX0. Thank you for hitting the super chat. It says, good morning to all. Good morning to you, SX0, even though it's 25 to 3 here in the afternoon. Hey, John, they may not, the, 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 the Brits may not know what uh, file 13 is. You might have to unpack that a little bit. Yeah, it's a shit game. Yeah, I've got another. Right. Hold on one sec, Babs. Go ahead. What's, I heard 13. I didn't hear the other bit. File 13, it's shit can. They're synonymous. No pun intended. Okay, then. So, is it just time for it? Is it I just time want to summarize, sorry, just before, I, I know I've made a humorous aside, which wasn't very humorous, oh, but okay. nonetheless, I'm just going to clarify the position. So, given that it's using inertia, something that's an actual happening, with pseudo force which is a not actual happening, then you can quote unquote shit can this nonsense from Wiki. <laughs> just 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 notice something on my Skype. I, I like having my nice big screen now. I can see what's going on around me. And around me, Anthony's currently having a row with Trish Blythe on Skype. <laughs> Which is great. <laughs> I, I guess we're gonna shit can that too. <laughs> I'm just shit staring. We can, we can shit. We can shit can all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah, that's correct. All of that wiki nonsense. When there's a contradiction like that, where they're describing non actual forces and giving them a comparison to a inertial force, then you can go, well, this has got a contradiction in it. So shit can. Yeah. Yeah, I got another one for you. Um, you don't agree that there's a distance to the moon or that it can be measured? Uh, that's, a, that's a very carefully phrased question. I don't know. What, my <laughs> answer is going to be just as weaselly. Sorry. I don't know what the moon is. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, that, that is kind of weaselly. It is, but I, I don't know if it's a reflection of something or it may not have a distance at all for all I know. And based on the fact I don't know what it is, I'm not going to start saying that we need to measure something. Not a okay. Why, why do we get? Um, uh, hold on, I'm being heckled. A return signal. Oh, sorry, Babs. Hold on one second. Radio waves. I'm, I'm just getting heckled. Um, I I said that we know that it's not a reflection off the sun. That's for damn sure. What thanks to specular reflections? Because you can't get uniform we reflections. Get... The only. The only way that the sun can be, or the moon can be reflecting the sun's light is this, as if the moon is flat or concave. This is 60 level optics. I'm going to be going Ooh. over this on my show in a few weeks. Speaking of which, a shameless plug. Today, QE Live, man, be here or be sphere. We're going to do a couple science topics and toe tag an astronomer. Thanks. <laughs> cool, cool. So, yeah, that's. Quantum Eraser YouTube channel, Be Here or Be Sphere, 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, 8 p.m. UK. That's Quantum Eraser channel. I just want to do a quick shout out to Bible Literalist. She says, The moon must have a distance because we can focus on it or make it out of focus. QE, whenever That's you toe silly. tag an astronomer. Um, <laughs> hold on, Tenth Man. Sorry, sorry Q just one second, Tenth Man. Go ahead, Babs. How do we get a signal? Uh, sent back when we send radio waves to the moon. No, you don't. What's happening with that? No, what's happening with that? It, it's people making shit up. Have you ever heard the, the phrase free space path loss by chance? Say that again. Free space what? Free space path loss by chance. Has path to do loss, with okay. the inverse square law. No, I've never heard that before. Yeah. I, I, I'd suggest looking into that. Go ahead and type that in and Maybe we can talk about it some later date, but you ain't bouncing any friggin' radar off no moon. No chance. Space half loss? Free, F-R-E-E, -E, space path loss. Oh, okay. What are, what are ham radio right. operators talking about when they say that they can get signals back 
when they send radio oh, waves yeah? to the moon. We'll, we'll show what are they talking about? Yeah, can you show it that it's hitting off the moon? Right, that was um, my question they, also. Uh, hold, hold on, Owen. Hold on. They say that um, when they pointed no, in I different they, directions, uh, no, they didn't I mean, hold, hold, show. hold on, hold on, QE. Go ahead, Bubs. It, they say that when they point it in different directions, they don't get anything back. But when they point it at the moon, they, they do get something back. Can I respond? Yeah, of course. Go ahead. I don't care what they say. I want to see they show. Okay? Right. Exactly. So did you have a question? Oh, I want to see them showing it too, yeah. Okay. I Hold want the signal data comparison. Just a graph would be a start, at least. Just showing the comparison of the signal they got in, in full spectrum, of pointing it at the moon and away from it. That would be a start. Okay. It's baloney anyway, because of free space path loss. It's, it's, it's hogwash. This, is, this conversation is academic. It's baloney. The problem is that the mathematics for the return signal is going to be based on several things that are presupposed. First and foremost, the presupposition that Earth is a sphere. And then the distance is based on, what is it, Kepler's third law of interplanetary motion, applied to the presupposition of Earth and Venus having the same spherical radius. That's how they plot out the distances for the expected return signal. That's how they do the maths. Well, if you're there's basing... An, there's another one. Go on. Sorry, what was the other one? I've missed one. What There's another there? one. There's another assumption there. Speed of light. Oh, of course. Yes. The Hello, speed of the... <laughs> yeah. It was completely forgot. Yes, of course. And the assumption of the traveling time based on the speed of light. So if you've got all of these mathematical presuppositions, and as Anthony pointed out a couple of shows ago, you take a return signal, which is just essentially a load of noise, and they say, look, this part of the noise is the return signal. Well, where are they looking for that return signal? They're looking at it in a time frame based on that presupposition of that mathematics. It's hogwash. Hey, is that's Anthony still a, with us? Uh, that's okay. going to be another topic. Uh, hold on, QE. Gonna... Sorry. Hold on. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Tenth Man. No, I was wondering when Anthony gets back, I have something for him that. Uh... Yes, Lee. Paul has. Yeah, Paul, go ahead and post that. Uh, or Nathan, can you post Paul's screen and. Anthony, I got something for you. Yeah, sure. So, like I was saying, that's probably going to be oh, hold another on, show. Hold on, hold on. Go ahead. Oh, it's, we've, got Paul, we've got Paul's screen presented. Tenth man's got right. a point to make. He's asking Sleeping Warrior. Go ahead. Yeah, Anthony, I pulled this off of a Forbes article. I put the whole article in Master B so you could go to it. It's about Al Gore and his, his cronies trying to get carbon credits and with this global warming nonsense. But here, interesting, it referenced uh, a Sir Michael Burton, a judge in London's High Court. Have you seen this before? No. Well, read the bottom part or read the whole thing, actually. But the bottom really says it at the very end. He, sta he stated it is built around the charismatic presence of the ex-Vice President Al Gore, whose crusade is to persuade whose crusade is to persuade, Jesus, that's a good phrase, isn't it? The crusade to persuade the world of the dangers of climate change caused by global warming. It is now common ground that this is not simply a science film, although it is based substantially on science research and opinion, but is clearly a political film. Yeah, it was overtly a political film. Uh, the, qu the key question is, what makes it a political film? Because the whole heart of their nature are not generally <laughs> political. Yeah, you oh, may express hold on, political. Hold reasoning. on, Anthony. Hold on. I think Tenth Man's trying to say you might have missed the point. Go ahead, Tenth Man. Well, if you read the whole article, it's because he and his buddies, uh, Wall Street, two faced buddies, decided they were going to uh, print up these carbon credits. And if you bought them early, you get them at a discount. And then if you sell them later, when all the laws pass, you're going to make a billion. <laughs> That's the whole point of Al Gore's little game here. Oh, they wanted to tax air more than they do already with carbon taxing. Interesting. It's pre predates carbon taxing, right? Uh, it happened anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They just want more. Always more. Of course. Very good. Sorry, yeah. QE. Did That's you... it. Sorry to interrupt you. No, nah, the point's lost, man. Uh, I was I was riveted over global warming in Al Gore. Please continue. 
Well, I have a good pun, and I got interrupted. I can't even say it. I regret nothing. Well, when when QE said he was going to toe tag an astronomer, I said well, the only thing that will happen is he'll lose his star status. Well, a self-professed astronomy degree holder. It's been a long time coming for this knucklehead. Wait. What's an what's an astronomy degree? The ability to name stuff in the sky. Uh, how does that work? <laughs> Well, like didn't, serious, didn't, well, didn't Carl was Sagan have, <laughs> wasn't that something that Carl Sagan had as, I, I seem to remember looking at Carl Sagan's qualifications and he'd essentially name something. I'll have to look at it up. Give me a minute. Oh, so I wasn't that off then, huh? <laughs> I was just looking up on uh, free space path loss and it talks about um, radio signals between two ISO tropic antennas and how you you would lose some of that um signal over distance that's the gist that i'm getting off of this i'm also reading wikipedia so i could be wrong yeah it's a lot more than that and you got another big, big assumption here is what's being what's between you and the moon uh atmosphere and uh, what else? I don't know. Just atmosphere. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm talking about. It's not only what you do know, it's the more important thing here is what you don't. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep reading this. Just while you do, so I just found, found the article. I wasn't quite right. So Sagan argued the now accepted hypothesis, in parentheses, not our, not our scientific hypothesis, that the high surface temperatures of Venus can be attributed to and uh, can be attributed to and calculated using the greenhouse effect. <laughs> That's a good one. Great hypothesis. Can he? Can, did they cite the independent dependent variables? In they that? didn't. No, no, and they wouldn't have those either. <laughs> I'd like to see the control variables too. In the <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see what they varied. <laughs> yeah, yeah, their imagination. Indeed. But it wasn't quite naming something, but some bullshit he made up about something that he sees in the sky. He's just said, that's the greenhouse effect on that light up there. Oh, really? You're just, you're just saying that, right? Yeah. Well, that's now an accepted, uh, apparently, scientific hypothesis. Put the word hypothesis in front of any old bullshit, and anybody that doesn't appreciate the difference between pseudoscience and science will go, hypothesis, you say? Wow, that sounds scientific. Better trust what this dude says about the greenhouse yeah. effect on the light in the sky. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Yeah. But, but maybe he followed the first step, which was uh, ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It, what he did was he, he, he followed the first step. He observed a natural phenomena, of course. He observed the natural phenomena of a second law of thermodynamics violation claimed to be a gas next to a vacuum. And then he decided to call that gas next to a vacuum a greenhouse effect. Because, yeah, man, violations of a law of nature class as natural phenomena. What a clowns, man. Hey, Chocolate, you had a point about astronomers looking up. Uh, there's a site called starregistration.com. And for a small fee and many different categories, you can name a star and they'll send you a certificate and a celestial map and an official registration form. So if it's a standard one, it's only $39.90. If it's a, a constellation, oh, it's that's $59. So I, I, get, I get to adopt a star, like like adopting a dog in some other country. That's awesome. Wait, you're no, interested. No, than, you're interested. You hold on, hold on. There might be a punch you here. You get to name it. You, you're interested in doing that then, Chocolate? I can do it for half price. <laughs> 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 you I'm gonna shop around money. for better prices. So, I'm serious, yeah, man. You got you, first dibs. Look, man, <laughs> I'm dead serious. If you want to name a star, I can make that happen. Oh, oh, but that's line. black market, though, Nathan. That's not gonna come on the official registry. Look, I know you're gonna just set up your own star naming bullshit, Arwin. So shh. Star I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind a chocolate saying star. Why not? <laughs> 
Oh, chocolate saying that's quite a lot of letters. Mm. I might be might not be half price. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We uh, could work say, out. Maybe we could find a planet to name after you. We'll call it Vegeta. I know that doesn't come cheap. No, the binary oh, wow. ones are ninety nine dollars. <laughs> get buy one, get two all. I mean Disney paid <laughs> paid a lot for Pluto. It's just a dog and pony show. <laughs> boom boom. <laughs> <laughs> Profound and hilarious. <laughs> I, like, I like your cafe of Moco, whatever. I don't know how you got all that memorized, but you did good on that one, Keith. No foam. <laughs> yeah, no foam. Think, do you think that did everybody watch a salute to my, to my accelerating coffee cup? <laughs> Apparently, people remember that shit. I go to 24-7 talking about accelerated coffee cups. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> this shit is following me around now? It's awesome. <laughs> not not to story top, but somebody had trimmed out a little piece of an interview with Mark Sargent, and he's essentially describing the second law of thermodynamics violation that is the so-called outer space, otherwise known as a sky vacuum. And he's detailing it beautifully. And I'm like, if I was QE right now, I'd be really proud. Really? Did Mark Sargent was doing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll dig out the clip. I'll send it to you. He does a really All good right, job of it. You. you know, perfect. You couldn't fault him. Sweet. Mark Sargent's been talking about gas pressure for years, though. Sure, but it's, it's more the fact that it's been succinctly summarized in such a concise way by QE to the point where you can bang, bye-bye space with a couple of sentences. Just want to shout out Leonardo Gonzalez. I see, yeah. Uh, Nathan, if chocolate doesn't want in, here's my 20. No worries, I'll send you out a certificate, Leonardo Gonzalez. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I was going to say, did everybody watch Globusters last Sunday? I just had an email from Leonardo Gonzalez that says he wants his star to be called Chocolate Saiyan, and <laughs> he's got a website advertising it for sale. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, this guy's look. this guy hang on, this guy's smart. He's gonna turn around after naming it Chocolate Saint and sell it to Chocolate Saint for more. Good job, Leonardo. I don't know. Can't hustle yeah. hustler. I'm from New York. Yeah, you, you, can, <laughs> you don't have to like it. You don't have to like it, Chocolate. You know, obviously people are spotting the value in this and uh, you know, I can only nod my own head to my entrepreneurial skills in this regard. <laughs> 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 it's too late chocolate he patented your Happy name you lost your name nah, if you do negative. if you do want an, a star naming that. yeah you feel free smash the super chat i, I can do this all day <laughs> <laughs> i mean night yeah, i mean yeah, night yeah. not day night night <laughs> it's a binary star we could name the other one vanilla sand <laughs> I'm down and, with that. And, and Nathan, you, you have an endless supply of stars since the universe is expanding. You'll you'll be rich in a day. Yeah, that's it. Just buy a stronger telescope if you're over and out. Speaking of telescopes, my, my mother in law's pestering my wife to get rid of the telescope I dumped off there when we had our first child. So I haven't had a telescope now for three years. And it's just sat there, and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? How can I convince it to keep it? Because I don't want to get rid of it. It's my telescope, right? I could find someone to give it away to. I'm like, I don't want to give it away. I didn't even want to take it out the out of the apartment in the first place. Anyway, enough of me moaning. Shout out to Take Back Space, Christie's channel. Pretty much eradicated the need for a telescope anyway. Are you still arguing with Trish in Skype, Anthony? Take that as a yes. Sorry, I didn't realise I was on mute. Uh, no, no, no. She's just got a different view. I don't agree with her. I'm legally correct. She's legally incorrect. It's the end of the, end of the matter, it is. 
interesting because the other day when we were discussing their critique of your paper with what was claimed to be a solicitor analysing it, he he deemed that it would be a loser. And Trisha's comment on that was to say, you know, I can give my assessment of something in terms of how I would argue it, but to just say anything's a winner or a loser outright is, is something that solicitors don't tend to do. And I got the impression she was sort of hinting at, I don't necessarily think this guy is what he says he is. And then Spurs put something up um, in regards to him questioning something that this, I think it's the same dude, I could be wrong, but somebody questioning whether or not judges had the ability to interpret the meaning of words in context and of it, law. And I think Spurs got it slightly wrong. Um, I think what the guy said, th- the problem with Spurs is he played a bloody advert over the no, over the top of the critical part when this guy was saying this bit that I was listening for. I can't hear what the guy says exactly. I can hear snippets in between the noises, like gunshots that Spurs has got firing because he's a burk. And then it, what the guy's saying is that the judge is not going to be deciding the shape of the earth. And he's right. The shape of the earth isn't relevant for the discussion. What's relevant is, is the way that it's being taught lawful or not? So it's got nothing to do with the shape of the earth. And I think that's what the guy was saying, but I couldn't hear it because Spurs is an idiot. He's overlaid the sound on top of it, so I can't hear what the guy's actually saying. But I'm, I'm, no, I don't think Spurs has got got the re, the recite correct with what he said. Um, I actually agree with the other guy when he said that the judge will not be deciding what shape the earth is. He won't be, and I, I do agree with that. But it, I can't, like I say, I can't hear what's being said because Spurs is a spaz. Shout out to Spurs. Ch- chocolate. Uh, hold on, just read out a super chat. Um, Trish Blythe says not until they have had consideration I have had consideration and I will debate him live if he wants to call me out and say he's won lol so she's super chatted twice she's proper heckling you Anthony I like her a lot I like you Trish you're ace <laughs> so she's basically calling you out and saying I'd like to debate you on this subject yeah, I'm not going to debate somebody on my side of the discussion to give ammunition to the baller's armor. So I'm not prepared to have a small battle with Trish on a point that I disagree with her on if it helps them with the bigger battle overall. So as much as I'm happy to do it, because I don't agree with Trish's interpretation of the, the intentions of the act of parliament in question and how she comes to her conclusion, I'm not prepared to give her any give the ballers any ammunition. So at this time, right now, Trish you're respectfully declined on the basis that I'm not going to give them any any ammunition at all. I don't totally respect what that. That's fair enough. That was, in the back of my mind when she asked, that was kind of what I thought. I was going to stab you in the back and go, I've already had that discussion with, with you and Trish, or, I, or listened in, and at the end I sided with her. But, you know, I'm not... That. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a totally dick move, but I've done it in a segue, so I'm not really doing that. <laughs> There are many ways to interpret and skin a cat. And just because Trish has a view is a view doesn't mean that that's the way that it's going to go because she has a view. In the same way, it doesn't mean that it'll go the way that I have because I have a a, a, a different, a different but similar view. You don't know what a judge is going to decide. And anyone that says that they do is a moron because judges can change the law as well as change the definitions at will. They're assholes. That's why no one really likes going to court because it just depends on what mood the judge is in. There's a lot of things a judge can do. So whilst judge, uh, whilst uh, Trish has presented an argument that is credible, I disagree with it, and I'm entitled to disagree with it, and so is everybody. She's so entitled to disagree with chat. Mike. She's she's got one last poke for you. I've got to read it out. It says, "If you are so sure you will win, let's debate." Now I've, I've got to side with Anthony on that score. I'm afraid, Trish. And what all you're doing is is kind of the conclusion we had at the end of yesterday's conversation was that this is surplus to requirements. This isn't destined for a courtroom. It's never going to be adjudicated by a judge. It's an academic paper. And in terms of the way that it's been intentionally uh, phrased for Anthony to conform to get his mark, he has to provide both sides of the argument and an in-depth understanding of the legal point within a specific area of his chosen subject. Well, he's done that. So, what Trish wants to do, and Anthony, I know he won't deny it, also wants to do this, is he wants to see what would happen hypothetically if this was ever taken to its fruition, which isn't really necessary. Now, in terms of the, 
the argument that it stimulates in terms of that, I think if, in, in the future, yeah, that would be perfectly valid to do. But I think at this particular jun juncture, it's not really fair to do that to Anthony. You know, not not I just. Don't mind. I don't mind having a pre-recorded moot with Trish that we agree that we don't release until after a certain key date. Because I don't want to give the ball as any ammunition. If, you, if you've got Anna, I mean, I know Trish's argument. I disagree with her for legitimate reasons. And I'm all for having a moot. But I'm not going to give the ball as any, any ammunition at all when this point that you're arguing right now, Trish, they've not even seen yet. So let's not have that. Let's not give them any ammunition. I will agree in front of everybody right now that we can debate a moot. We can moot the point that you're asking for, but not to be released before a certain landmark is passed because I'm not giving them ammunition. But if you want a moot and you want a disagreement, bring it on, sister. I'm all saying. for it. Well done. That's not what she's asking for. She's, she says, that's right, Nathan, to my last point, which I won't repeat because I'm about to round out the live show and ask the people watching on the promo ring stream to stay tuned. But she's saying, don't call me out then, basically. And she's laughing about it. So I know this is all you know friendly. But as I say, if you are watching this on... Na oh, one more time. Thanks very much for the super chat, uh, Trish Blythe. Really appreciate your support. If you are watching this on Nathan Oakley 1980... No, 19... <laughs> start again if you're watching this on nathan oakley then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow unfortunately if you are watching this on nathan oakley 1980 got there in the end then this is where we bid you farewell a massive huge enormous thank you to all of you who smashed the super chat liked commented shared subscribed and all that good stuff be sure to check out nathanoakley.com <laughs> god she's still poking you anthony she says not pre-recorded live because i'm confident <laughs> Great poke. I like Trish. She's great. Anyway, stay tuned if you're watching on Nathan Oakley. Another massive thank you to all of today's debating panel for making this live show possible. I've been Nathan Oakley and I'll see you all in the next video. Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! Trish is ace. She knows how to poke, man. She's a good poker. She, she's a lawyer. Is Anthony, is Anthony <laughs> yeah, she knows how to poke. Anthony run away. Oh, really? Anybody seen any actual proof of that? Don't, where's Anthony gone? Ooh, hope I haven't pissed him off. Probably. He's probably going to be generating more super chats for you. <laughs> Let's hope so. Hey, Nathan. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hey, can you increase the live stream number for a second so I can pop in there? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, just increase it by two or something so some knucklehead doesn't jump in. Would, if I could find my mouse. <laughs> yes, it's, it's vanished. Just push oh, the cheese out. Okay. Want to increase it by a couple? Yeah. To t go ahead. And no, not decrease it. Increase it. How do I do that then? There's a cog. Go go to live stream, and there's a cog to the right. Edit channel. Yeah. Yeah, and then is it in invites? Um, it should be. I oh, can't using remember. It's down there on. Oh, it's on a slider. I see. Yeah. Okay. Done. I still can't get in. Nineteen now. Let's see. Am I in there? Yeah, I'm in there. Okay, thank you. You just want to boot them all to the after show. Not telling me. Yeah, that's what it's for. But it's odd because as a mod, you should be able to enter. Just for the record, I doubt very much Anthony's annoyed at me or Trish for that matter. Uh, I'm on the application mode for this thing and it ain't working. You, man, I'm right in the middle of breakfast too. All right, let me get out of here.
All right, continue on. I'll I'll try something else. Mm, okay. I, d I didn't know really what you were trying to do in the first instance, but great. He's got to be in there to move everybody to the after show. Ah, okay. So we didn't have a baller today, did we? A Babs playing devil's advocate. He did a very good job. Yeah, so Babs does that well. Can I, can I play the Johnny Johnny Baller? Johnny Which no, can? Already a baller Go there. ahead. Couple of. I can't move. I think him. I'm happy. So you just have to put up on it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Someone says, Can I play Johnny Baller? Okay, yeah, sure, go ahead. Silence. Uh, Muttering. Me? What? Where? Discord server. Oh. No, it's just crickets as usual. Maybe he's playing Johnny oh, Globehead after being asked, how do we have Gas Rush without a container? <laughs> Go on, Dances with Fools. Go ahead. Hi. So uh, if, I, if I get a telescope and then I look at a star and then I put a prism at the end of my telescope and then I get a rainbow from the light of the star, then I will notice that there are some dark lines on that rainbow. And this tells me that the star is made of elements. Why? That's nice. Is that a permanent? Why? Concept? Why does it do that? Oh, uh, uh, did someone ask why? Yeah. We... Yeah. Yeah, because because when I do that on Earth. Uh, like when I when I heat up some uh, pile of uh, junk and then it becomes like uh, white hot, then I do the same thing. I I get the I see the light through a prism, and I also get a rainbow, and then I can correlate the dark lines that I see on the rain. Okay. Uh, sorry. Say again. Yeah, I'm in the middle of breakfast. I have something to say okay. about that, but I, I got to eat. Can you guys string him out for a little bit? He's talking oh. about spectroscopy. I was going to yeah. say, I've done a video that yeah, was titled Transsexual Spectroscopy. He, he's playing. He's I know, he's playing, playing Johnny Globehead. <laughs> so, I've got a video called Transsexual Spectroscopy. Have you ever seen that video by any chance? Probably not. No, but it's a, it's a very funny name. Sure. So I'll I'll give you the example. You're you're at the side of a lake, right? And on this side of the lake, you've got a row of ten beautiful women, and you've got a really high-powered zoom camera or a telescope or whatever, so you can see across the lake. It's quite a significant different uh, distance. It's a very big lake, but on the other side of the lake, what you can see is what appears to be a woman. She's got a dress, she's got long hair, she's wearing high heels, she's got a scarf blowing in the breeze. You can make it all out, just about. It's very small, but you can just about make it out. Now, based on your correlation between what you see in that telescope and what's on your shore, would you be content to say that what you see on the other side of the lake is a woman? I I um I'd have to say no. Hold on. <laughs> when it's when it's light going through a prism, yes. When it's a woman on the other side of the lake, clearly comparable to the women on this side of the lake. No? I don't understand. Why would it not be just yes like with this like with the prism? Well, I I am I am seeing them from a distance in the in the case of the star, but in the case of uh, the 
white hot glowing pile of uh, junk, uh, then I, I made the pile. So presumably I know what it's made of. And then I make a map um, on, on the rainbow. So I correlate uh, dark patch number one with uh, iron and dark patch number I understand that. So you're going to correlate hat, looking like a girl's hat, with one of the girls on this side of the light that's got a girly hat on. And then you're going to go scarf, pink in colour, like one of the girls on this side of the uh, lake that's got a pink scarf on by coincidence. And then you go dress, knee length, like one of the girls on this side, knee length dress. So it's definitely a woman on the other side of the lake, right? It's comparable in every way. Right? Yeah, they they are comparable. Um, I I think I'm sorry. I think I'm having a little bit of uh, audio issues, so I'll also try to open a page in YouTube for this one. This yeah, sorry about that. This isn't broadcast live, so you're not going to find that, unfortunately. Oh, okay. So hmm. I, I appreciate so I your can... hesitation, given that I started this example with the title Transsexual Spectroscopy. So I appreciate your <laughs> hesitation. But so far, we've got something that's analogous. Would you not agree? This side of the lake, we've got women. This side of the lake, we've got a burning pile of junk. Yeah, junk's a great word, eh? <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hmm. It's um, the problem of um, the problem of the lake that I'm. I can't really sample the um, the lady over the lake to verify that it's a lady. Can I? What about the star? Can you do that with that? Can you verify that star hasn't got a penis? I mean, is actually made of iron. <laughs> I'm. I. I'd, I'd have to. I'd have to uh, dial up some magic space machine. Um, but other than light, no. Just so, about two more minutes, man. I'm almost done I'm trying to suck this down. What I would usually ask would be, um, if you're telling me that you see some uh, element either absorbing light, uh, thereby creating a gap in the spectrum, or uh, absorbing and re-emitting light, thereby creating a bright line in the spectrum, then my question is, how do you know where this element is along the line of sight between you and the light source? Because it could be very anywhere. well done. Very that's well the... done. Who's that speaking? Sorry, say again. That's one. That's one problem. Very well done. Who 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 said that? Uh, that that was me. What, what was his name? Nate? Dancers with fools, I believe. Dancers with fools. Yep. Ah, yes, that's a very good point. Um, uh, another problem is the difference between terrestrial and stellar spectroscopy, right? Okay. There's another problem with Kirchhoff's law of thermal emission. And there are more problems with, do you know the different types of spectra? I, I know of two kinds, the emission and the absorption ones. Yep. There's one more continuous. Right, so you got continuous. Um, I'm I'm not sure. I, I I don't remember that one. No. Yeah, it's continuous, and then you got two sides of the same coin, just the flip side, uh, emission and absorption spectra. So. Oh, I see. Is, this yes. is a good yes, topic. I, I was thinking about this for an, another topic for a show. I got the three or four topics out of out of j this just show today. So, yeah, that's got spectroscopy's coming. I'm gonna hammer these globe tart idiots. All they, all you ever hear, they can't even pronounce the word correctly. Number one, I've heard 
spectroscopy, um, spectroscopy. Uh, they they just <laughs> they say, well, we know what the sun's made of, and that all they say is spectroscopy, and that's where it ends. They just stop right there, like that solves all their problems. You freaking weaking parody morons! Say that shit in front of me one time. I rip your guts out and then leave them out there for the friggin' worms to eat. Clowns. I I think what's also a little bit of um, po poetic justice, if you will, is that um, when when you do spectroscopy, you don't really use a prism, but you actually use a slit. Yeah, that's not the big problem here. That's that's neither here nor there. That's that's not the issue that I'm speaking of. There's other issues other than that. Like five other big ones, elephants. <laughs> Physicality assumption bias, perhaps? I, I don't actually see like that as an issue. How the hell do you verify what the hell you're reading? <laughs> Hold on. Just, Maybe just, that. Uh, it, goes, it goes deeper than that. There's nothing wrong with spectroscopy. Nothing wrong. I was about to say, I, I don't but see any you... issue. What's the issue with causing diffraction and measuring the wavelength or deriving the wavelength? I should say that's that's perfectly acceptable. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, stellar or not stellar, but terrestrial spectroscopy. I mean, that's it's ironclad. You're not going to get around it. But problems start to arise when you start to extrapolate that to something out in space. Stellar spectroscopy. They're not the same. Not even in the same galaxy. So it's an equivocation. What? It's an equivocation fallacy then. No, it's a false equivalent. No, it's a false equivalent. False equivalent. Even though it has the same name, it's still I was false say, equivalent. It's got the same name though. <laughs> yeah, it does. It, it, there, yeah, there's some middle ground there. Yeah. Yeah, we'll use both. Equivocation and false equivalent. But maybe maybe this is a discussion off there, but yeah, I, I, want, to, I want to figure out how that's a false. Yeah, I do see how it's a false equivalence because it's two different things with the same word. With the same word, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's both. what I said. We can do both. You're fine. It's both, idiot. Yeah, yeah. Don't, no, no, no further discussion. It's both. It's an equivocation and a false equivalence. False equivocation. <laughs> Not a false equivocation. Uh, that's that's what I used to use. I used to get John off air saying, you, "It's not false equivocation. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's either an equivocation." <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did say that on the show, yeah. right? No, no. no Steve McClown <laughs> started saying that. Nathan, I think Nathan heard him say it and then started using it. So now nah, this is Steve McClown's, all his false equivocation. There's no such animal. If it was a false equivocation, then it wouldn't be an equivocation, you friggin' moron. But that they was make the an assumption uh, about light. Uh, sorry, did I did I talk over someone? Yeah, me. But that's all right. It's okay. It, it, I, I treat it more as a gift eruption now. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I'll I'll wait. Sorry. <laughs> It gives me a chance to think about what I was saying and possibly rephrase to make it clear. So thank you. Wow. <laughs> oh, quite some entanglement. You're always so nice. And courteous. On the, <laughs> on the equivocation, I think that, uh, um, I think they, uh, I think, I think in the story, is that they make some assumptions about light in the universe. So they, uh, they assume that light is something that travels isotropically and um, in all directions and such. So, so they assume that they already uh, know uh, that in principle, the, the light coming out of a glowing white glowing hot pile of junk is in nature the same as as the light coming from a distant star as they call it so in that regard they're entitled to um, 
equivocate in, in such fashion, which for the record, I disagree with. Well, the light that they, and this isn't my topic of choice, but the light that they observe here is within an atmosphere. Is that right? Some of the spectroscopy will take place in, uh, in one of the best uh, vacuums possible. So um, a machine will be creating a vacuum for uh, perhaps a week. And then the material that um, is going to give out a spectrum um, is going to stay there and, and uh, you know, progressively become heated until it glows and glows and glows. So this so, vacuum uh, you're talking about, do they do it with a container or without a container? Oh, the laboratory with a, with a container, of course. How else well, would they make the vacuum? Thank you very much. So how can they equivocate a vacuum within a container to one they say that doesn't have one? Oh, uh, they do that by claiming that the, the star is embedded in vacuum. So that's, that's the first presupposition. And uh, then they also assume that the vacuum that the star is in, um, along with the light emitted by the star, is qualitatively the same as uh, the vacuum in their chamber and, and the radiation glow coming out of whatever is being heated up and, and has its spectrum measured. So then they'd have so to admit too... that everything has a container. Yes, and also make two presuppositions about light and how it works. So are they saying that the stars that they're studying out in the sky is within a container, but it's also a vacuum? Not from what I read. From what I read, they, they just say that they are um, perpetual... Uh, nuclear fusion explosions that are maintained by gravity and they just they just hang there in space yeah that's but they another, can't do right? they can't that's, that's ahead, another John. second law of thermodynamics violation yeah, but they can't uh, do that uh, with the experiments so-called experiments pseudo experiment here on earth they need a container to do it so how are they going to find uh equality of the one out there with the one here when this one needs a container? Well, they cannot, uh, as far as I know, nobody's claiming to uh, be making an experiment where they make a star on Earth because they'll say that um, that too much pressure is needed to simulate the conditions that supposedly take place at the heart of stars, hearts of stars. So and what uh, kind of pressure? They would say that. How, how would they even know what the hell condition that was? And what what do we know Jokes. about pressure? What do we know about pressure? And what kind of pressure could exist without a container? Under pressure, coming down on me, coming down on you. Yeah, I think. I think that part is ignored. I think the um, I think that part is ignored, and then the some some you know model for how pressure would be <laughs> inside <laughs> such a star is is being explored, you know. And then they come up with a number, and they say, "Here we need that many. Um, wh what's the unit uh, pascals of pressure?" and and it's a number with lots of zeros. So, so what is the uh, proof? Like their Sorry? IQ. <laughs> so Say again, please. Like their IQ. Lots of zeros. <laughs> Nathan, you around, man? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. 
What's up, brother? Uh, so I, I'm going to have to bolt here in a few minutes. Got to go see my computer guy. But um, <laughs> what's your status this afternoon? You going to show up? I still don't know what I'm doing this afternoon. I should have asked my wife. I just haven't spoken to her. She was at a meeting from her old job because she's got to go back to work eventually after her maternity. So I haven't really spoken uh, to her today. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Quite possibly, though. Yeah, it's only gonna it's gonna be short. It's not gonna be uh, more than an hour. I'm thinking thirty to forty five minutes. So seven forty five, I'll, I'll be calling you. Okay, yeah, give me a ring if you're bad. I'll definitely pick up the call. And uh, it's nice and easy when it's not me running the show. Oh yeah, no pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all on you. While you're sitting around with no guests coming <laughs> and things like that. That's okay. I was I was preparing to go with you know with me and my host the beautiful Betty Van Velsen. But, yeah, I'm prepared for that. But, hey, you know, there's an open invitation there, brother. Do you read yeah. your messages? Yeah, I saw your message. Yes, brilliant. Yeah, if I'm around, I'll definitely join you. Yeah, it's not like I said, it's not going to go for too long. You're going to really like it, man. Uh, I think you should be there. Well, I'll put my ears up as the 10th man when you said about, um, what was it, an astronomer? Well, he has an astronomy degree, self-professed. <laughs> And he was he is. was uh, carpet bombing uh, messages after the science presentation on Ballbusters the other day. So I'm gonna take him to the woodshed for like the thirty fifth thousandth time, somewhere around there. I'm gonna make him a star, superstar. And then Nathan could sell him one. I like it. As long as he doesn't sell him mine. <laughs> Where <Where'd> are <he? laughs> One absolute cock of crap, though. People will buy anything, won't they? A fool and his money yeah. have soon parted. You remember, uh, remember the pet rock? The guy made millions. Yeah. Put a couple of eyes and a couple of wiggly eyes on a rock and pet rock, right? Yeah. Put it in a box with a bit of bit of straw. Twenty dollars, please. No wonder people believe in the gas pressure without a container. Hey QE. You're gonna Yes. You're gonna be using the gift interruption line more often? Yes. Good, because I think it uh, enhances your presence of mind. It wasn't gift interruption. It was gift eruption. It's gift it eruption. Better. Get it right, man. Right. Presence of mind. Come on, M. <laughs> yeah, the presence. I got it. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Funny yet profound. Good way to wrap up a show. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow. What what happened to the show? Show some enthusiasm now. <laughs> <laughs> Increase the enthusiasm. Spectroscopy is real science, okay? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the, uh, yeah, that reminded me. I just got too many logs in the fire, man. I got a list of shows, and spectroscopy is definitely one. I'll get to it within the next six months or so. That's looking down the road. Ba -dum -bum. Where are the ballers? Munching crayons, and the slobber nurses got them in a friggin'. Tangle lock. Lives. I heard some rumblings from Discord just then. Share your pain. Bad stars. Yeah, go, go Stop muttering. <laughs> Put some bass in your voice. 
Sound off like you got a pair. You got to swallow the crayons before they start talking. Is there anybody in this court? I haven't looked. 21 people in the Discord server currently. Yeah, I can't move them either. No, they're hey, in Nathan, the show. Go, they're already there. Those guys? They're already there. I didn't move them. I can't. I couldn't hear you. I was talking. They've already been moved to the after show. Somebody else did it. I don't know who. Uh, okay, cool. Well, they, sh they should be all off mute. What's the matter with those guys? They just lost the spirit? Their god gravity died. Hmm. Good morning. I think the Coriolis effect really pounded these guys. It sure did. The lack thereof. <laughs> I, told, I told Zanuck yesterday that it's, it, it, he has to retire this argument. Zanuck, he should retire himself. He's finished. <laughs> I can't even show up anywhere anymore. He showed up on 24 7 yesterday again. Hey. Yeah, he Unbelievable. That's tantamount to the chairman of PETA showing up to work the next day after he was videotaped live clubbing baby seals the night before with a nail spike Louisville slugger. <laughs> Beautiful image. Yep, yep. Hey, these guys have no shame. They, did he forget about how we exposed him the other day? Yeah, I think he was trying to steer clear from that. Well, next time he <laughs> opens up his mouth, just ask him, are, are we getting the answers from you or from physics forms? Which one? Well, he says he was just double-checking with them. Double checking with them, but that comes over here and says we don't understand the argument, and yet he still doesn't understand the argument. That's adorable. Yeah, that, yeah, boy, that that covers his ass. Not. Well, if he's double checking with them, how come the one that told him he was wrong, he didn't stand by that one? Okay, maybe somebody better at this will step up in place of Zanuck. Yeah, he keeps moving reference frames to you. That's funny. And claiming we move reference frames. Uh, I, I'm with Coriolis as a whole back in the question fallacy by itself. Prove the earth is spinning. I'm, I'm down with that. We've destroyed this. It's dead and buried. <laughs> Prove the earth is freaking spinning first. I just step outside and I know it's not spinning. Yeah, RCMIC died again. Highlander, Mr. Chuckles yesterday died. Janet keeps dying, coming back. Yeah, it was either, it was either RC Meisty or Highlander. It was I think it was a show last week or something when he brought up the conservation of momentum, and I said, "What's the conservation of momentum?" And he freaking dropped. I can't remember which one it was. It was one of those two clowns. Wonder if they figured out what it was yet. I mean, technically, as soon as, they, as soon as they say that, Coriolis is over, right? <laughs> it's done. Technic yeah, technically, yeah, but they don't even know what it is. They just It's just like with spectroscopy or spectroscopy. They just bring up the word or phrase and think and think that they're the, like that cover covers them like. Oh, oh you got to call Sam's Meat Market. You kill them, we'll kill them. Isn't that CD Morgue? 
<laughs> sitting more and <laughs> killing each other. <laughs> You know, somebody sent me uh, a video, I think, uh, with Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about hurricanes. I'm not sure if it's new or not, but he, with the video came the message of, I think, Nathan and you guys are causing this to happen. <laughs> that now <laughs> they have to talk about hurricanes and, I guess, reestablish to the public that hurricanes are due to some force. So... I can I actually share that if you want. I'm not sure. But while you're while you're sharing that chocolate, I'm glad you said that because I was playing with that uh, around with that old school, no school thing uh, the other day, and um, there's actually something in on the. Um, I'm going to try to share it here in a second um, that actually could explain why nothing crosses the equator. Uh, let me get it pulled up here, and I'll show you. What equator? I know. I know. Um, let's see. Hold on a second. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what equator? What equator? It's a, it's a, a they line can't on even prove, it. They can't even prove the Earth is spinning and they want an equator? Mm -hmm. can't have an equator without a ball. <laughs> okay, can you see the screen now? You guys see it? I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, this is uh, a weather pattern, and it wasn't on the old one. Like, if you go back and look at the the old version of um, the um, uh, the old school, like at the back, way back machine, it's called CAPE. It's called co uh, Convective Available Potential Energy from Surface. And if you go read what that is, it's basically the buoyant air as it rises, just as it's rising. And if you look... Where does that mostly at on this? Right across through where the hurricanes are. So that would almost keep, almost like a barrier to keep the um, anything from going either direction. Is that uh, buoyant force, or that buoyancy of the air connective energy going upwards? Yeah, but what if they made that term up? Um, she hasn't called me back. Just bring it in. Can we do something with it after the fact? Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was, somebody's delivering something at the moment. Go ahead. I said, what if they just made that term up? We know there's high pressure, low pressure, and we know how weather works based on those two things. I don't know. I mean, it's, no. I looked it up. That that that, um, that is in the weather. If you look, if you go and look it up, that connective available potential energy is in most weather um, descriptions. You see it. You can look it up. What's what's the easy every man's everyday man's term for that what would you say uh, uh you just just tell just go ahead man no i don't know what does it stand for again c-a-p-e it's right here i don't know if it pops up but it's called connective or, co or convective available potential energy okay break down each word in the socratic method what is that actually saying What's, well, go ahead. I'm, I'm actually trying to deal with a couple of things here. Go ahead. Connect, you to... Did you say connective is the first one? No, convective. Con convective. So what's Evade. convective? Uh, like I said, go ahead. I've got some things. I, I'm trying to do two, multiple things here. Go ahead. Convective as in convection. Okay. So how does that fit with? The weather, I don't, I don't think you can get an answer out of him because he's, he's just said two or three times I'm dealing with other things. I just know my frustration when I'm like, oh, we haven't gone live on QE. Speak amongst yourselves. I'll sort it out. Why haven't we gone live, Nathan? What do you think the issue is, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's just a point I'm trying to make. It, I mean, I haven't broke it down completely, but it's just an observation and something from this old school. Of course, now my phone's ringing. With that, I'm going to say anyway, a huge, massive, enormous thank you to all of you who did tune in on the Nathan Oakley primary stream for hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, and all that good stuff. Of course, a massive thank you to all of today's debating panel for making this after show possible. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video. Oh, what a day! What a lovely day!